Esther, I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's program, Bad Feminism, with Roxane Gay, Andy Zeisler, and Connie Butler. Three of my idols. Um, for those of you who are visiting the Hammer for the first time, you might not be aware that we offer more than 250 free programs a year to our community. These range from talks like tonight to concerts, film screenings, poetry readings, conversations, lectures, political discussions, meditation, and a lot more that address the many facets of contemporary culture. So I hope you'll take a calendar home with you and come back and visit us often. Today's program is the launch of the Hammer's new initiative, the Bureau of Feminism. The Bureau's objective is to think deeply about feminism's role inside and outside of the museum. The Bureau will encompass exhibitions, performances, and public programs that reinforce the importance of feminist creation, inquiry, and activism in the midst of continually changing understandings of gender, gender roles, and what feminism means today. Our programming will touch on topics such as inter intersectionality, erasure, speech, embodiment, resistance, and collective consciousness. There's perhaps no better time for this conversation as we wrap up the final eight weeks of a hotly contested election season where one candidate's character has been and will continue to be read through the lens of her gender. Sadly, I don't think a day goes by without some infuriating news story that diminishes women. Recent highlights include the way the media covered Hillary Clinton's illness on Sunday, calling her unstable, and by the way, that was on MSNBC on a continual loop, unstable, unstable, unstable. The way women athletes were covered by the media at the Olympics last month. I can't even, I could spend a year just talking about that. <laughs> um, the misogynist online trolling of high profile women like actress Leslie Jones and gamer Anita, Anita Sarkeesian. The so called burkini ban in France, wherein police officers actually forced women to remove their clothes in public. The murder of Pakistani socialite Kandil Baluch the ongoing deaths of women, particularly women of color, at the hands of law enforcement officers, including just this year, Corinne Gaines in Baltimore, Jessica Williams in San Francisco, Keisha Michael here in Inglewood, and 16-year-old Janiah McMillan in Kentucky. Our speakers, Roxane Gay and Andy Zeisler, write about feminism in all its messy, problematic, and confusing manifestations, because talking about feminism in all its guises is absolutely essential to understanding our contemporary moment. Roxane Gay says, I embrace the label of bad feminist because I'm human, I'm messy. I can really relate to that. Um, Andy Zeisler writes about feminism in pop culture and how feminism gets commodified to sell products like nail polish, underwear, energy drinks, and even Swiffers. These are the women who can help the rest of us understand feminism today, from Gloria Steinem to Miley Cyrus and Caitlyn Jenner. It's really confusing, I'm just saying. I don't always get it, so I'm really glad they're here. Um, at The Hammer, we really wanna embrace that messiness. We hope to use the Bureau of Feminism Initiative to explore and interrogate the ways feminism intersects with art, with culture, and with politics. So we have a number of related programs, and today's program is one of them. At the moment, there are 10 other programs and exhibitions listed under, under the Bureau of Feminism umbrella, and you can find them in our printed calendar on page 13 and on our website. Next up is a collaboration with artists Jennifer Moon and Laub on October 1st and 2nd, and a performance by Jibs Cameron, AKA Dynasty Handbag, on October 2nd. Then on October 20th and 27th, we'll have performances by artist Janine Olson. We also have a number, a number of other public programs featuring rad women coming up at the Hammer. The next Hammer Forum will be on the politics of race in the 2016 elections on September 28th, and our guest speaker is Kristen Clark, Executive Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. On September 29th, we're screening a new documentary about artist Ava Hesse. Poet, poet Ann Carson will read here on October 23rd. Artist Amy Siegel will present her work on November 3rd. Maggie Nelson will read from her memoir, The Argonauts, as part of our Some Favorite Writers series on November 29th. And on October 19th, we'll screen the final presidential debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump live right here at The Hammer. And we have many other fascinating related programs as well, so please be sure to check out our calendar. As always, all of our public programs and exhibitions are free and open to the public, and if you'd like to receive reminder emails about them, please sign up. There are iPads in the lobby, and you can also sign up anytime on our website. Um, so on to our speakers for tonight's program. You can get a sense of the breadth and brilliance of Roxane Gay's writing by the places it's published. 
Her work appears in Best American Mystery Stories 2014, Best American Short Stories 2012, Best Sex Writing 2012, McSweeney's Tin House, Oxford American, American Short Fiction, the Virginia Quarterly Review, and many other journals, magazines, and newspapers. She's a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. She's the author of the books of fiction, Ayidi, and An Untamed State, and the for forthcoming short story collection, Difficult Women. And she's the author of many wonderful essays, which have been collected into the New York Times best-selling book, Bad Feminist, and her forthcoming book, Hunger. And she also made huge news at Comic-Con in July this year, when Marvel Comics announced she would author their new feminist comic book series, World of Wakanda, featuring female superheroes. Yes. Um, and An Untamed State will soon be made into a feature film directed by Gina prince Bythewood and starring Gugu Mbatha Ra. So apparently there is nothing she can't do. If there's any UCLA faculty in the audience, can you and I please start a campaign to try and lure her to come here to UCLA? Because I would die of joy. Um, Andy Zeisler is the co-founder and creative director of Bitch Media. Zeisler's writing on feminism, pop culture, and media has also appeared in Ms., Mother Jones, Salon, Bust, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Washington Post. She's the author of the 2008 book, Feminism and Pop Culture, and her latest book, released just this year, is a critique of how feminism is used today called We Were Feminists Once, From Riot Girl to Cover Girl, The Buying and Selling of a Political Movement. She wrote an op-ed piece about Hillary Clinton in the New York Times this weekend, and that article has consistently been at the top of the most read and most talked about articles list. If you haven't read it yet, it's called The Bitch America Needs Now, and you have to check it out. <laughs> Our moderator tonight is Connie Butler, the chief curator of the Hammer Museum. Prior to joining the Hammer, she was chief curator of drawings at MoMA in New York from 2006 to 2013, where she organized major exhibitions, including online, Drawing Through the 20th Century, and Greater New York. She was a curator at MOCA here in LA from 96 to 2006, where she organized the internationally acclaimed and still constantly referenced exhibition, WAC, Art and the Feminist Revolution. Yes, it was a great exhibition. She is the curator, cura I don't know. She's the co-curator with Anne Elgood of the Bureau of Feminism at the Hammer. All three of our panelists will be signing books um, in the Hammer Courtyard after the program, so please feel free to join us there later on. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Roxanne Gay, Andy Zeisler, and Connie Butler. Good evening. <laughs> I'm super in awe of these women, I told them. Um, I'm going to just add a few words of uh, welcome, really, to my colleagues here. Um, and then I know they are who you really want to hear from. Um, but just, I guess, for a little bit of context and maybe a few more words about this program, which is the sort of bigger frame for um, some of what we'll talk about tonight. So I'm Connie Butler. And I am thrilled to be here with Andy and Roxanne. Uh, you women do what I think of as the heavy lifting. That is, you speak your own truth to power in public through the written word in a way that becomes the truth, or at least convinces enough people that you manage to change the discourse. The time for outrage over things we already know is over. I love this quote of Roxanne's from her book, Bad Feminism. <laughs> I've been feeling and saying that I'm tired of talking about feminism. I've been working on this issue my entire adult and professional life. And I was just saying backstage, I've grown a little weary of the same conversations over and over. And I think that's one of the things we'll talk about tonight a little bit. What I really mean is, when I say that I'm tired of feminism, is that the time for outrage over things we already know is over. What both of these women do is take on very particular issues of language in our culture and pry apart what, for example, is at work when feminism is a slur, or to paraphrase Andy Zeisler, when bitch becomes a good thing. 
I'm up here in part tonight, as Claudia mentioned, because here at the Hammer, my colleague Anne Elgood and I, as well as January Arnal, have felt the need for a more meaningful conversation around feminism. What began as an idea about organizing a group show, which for various reasons may or may not happen, happen um, has morphed into something that we're calling the Bureau of Feminism. And I can talk, if people are interested, a little bit about how we kind of came up with that moniker. At an institution already committed in doing this work in a very public way in our exhibition and program, exhibitions and programs, we wondered what it would look like to return to the subject through a discursive, not bricks and mortar program and series of events. Could we have a sustained discussion around issues of gender, parity, feminism, around erasure and history? Bureau will unfold over time and space around broad thematics such as voice, and I think tonight is certainly um, a first entry very much in that topic, on that topic, resistance and collective consciousness, to name just a few. The projects will respond to the urgencies of political, social, and visual culture, which can be addressed through a feminist lens. Is there an urgency around feminism and feminist art, for example, we'll ask. Uh, I feel, at least in the art world, that we're on the brink of something really exciting and being more public about these discussions which have often happened behind closed doors. How can we use this conflict and discourse uh, as a productive force? So with that and a few of those thoughts, I'm going to um, start, I think, by asking, um, although Roxanne didn't really want me to do this, but I'm going <laughs> to maybe <laughs> open by, by suggesting that we, we make a definition of, a working definition of feminism, um, or perhaps um, if you both would rather intersectional feminism, which is something that um, maybe Roxanne, you want to start since you've written extensively about that. You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just felt like this audience would be savvy enough to not need a working definition of feminism at this point. That's, that was my only point. I, I just didn't, um, you know, what is feminism? I'm asked this question all the time and I'm like, what the fuck? I don't know. Um, but at its base, feminism is this radical idea that women are human and that we deserve to move through the world as human beings. We deserve respect and dignity and bodily autonomy. And to achieve that respect and that equality that we deserve, we have to think about women not only as women, but the other identities that we inhabit. So we have race and gender and sexuality and ability and body diversity and faith and class and these things mark us and affect us. And so we are all women, but not all women are treated equally. And so we need to think about that. And so for me, that's how I approach feminism. Um, I found it interesting that in the last several years as feminism has gotten you know, popular and it's something that uh, you know, celebrities, for instance, are asked about, there often is this question like, how do you define feminism? as though it's not a word that already has a definition. It's a really good definition. Um, but it's true that it doesn't necessarily go, like the dictionary definition doesn't go far enough. So you, know, you can say it's the, you know, it's the ideology that, that advocates for uh, economic and social and political equality of the sexes, but it also does have to take into account this idea that um, people are, you know, they come from different places and they experience oppression in very different, sometimes overlapping ways. And so I think intersectional definition, that intersectional definition is a way of saying, you know, the dictionary definition is great, but there does have to be a little bit more to it. But it does not mean that you can just make up your own definition, so. Do you want to maybe talk, Andy, a little bit about this, um, the op-ed over the weekend that Claudia mentioned, um, uh, which was about Hillary Clinton and sort of a reappropriation, which you've written about actually in a, num a number of times for the last like 10 years, in fact, about, um, and of course, Bitch is the name of your media project, which is now almost 20 years old. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's, it's interesting because we, when we started Bitch, uh, my co-founders and I in 1996, we were really interested in the idea of language reclamation. And our case study was the word queer, 
which had been reclaimed uh, by LGBTQ, uh, you know, various uh, organizations and, and coalitions um, to, to, to really take the sting out of the word queer. And it had been done, we felt, or we could see it had been done pretty successfully. Um, you know, to reclaim that epithet is, is not a small thing. And so we did think about what if the same could be done for bitch. Um, 20 years later, if you'd asked me, I would be like, that was just a roaring failure. That has not worked. We have not reclaimed bitch at all. <laughs> but at the same time, I do think, you know, people are more likely to, to, to see the sort of um, flexibility of it, the plasticity of how it's used um, when you're talking about something that is a good thing and something that's um, you know, still kind of a misogynist way to address a woman who's doing or saying something that, that you don't want her to be. Um, so yeah, I mean, in, in terms of this op-ed that I wrote, I thought it was fascinating to look at the way that a certain group of people would you know, call Hillary Clinton a bitch. You know, they, would, they would do it. She could be doing anything, and they would call her a bitch. But there was this other group of people that were really sort of reveling in and embracing her bitchiness. Um, you know, the people who created the texts from Hillary Tumblr, um, <laughs> right? Yeah, and uh, you know, the people who were creating memes with, you know, just Hillary, you know, doing all sorts of badass stuff. And it's interesting to me that those, you know, very diametrically opposed people were really reacting to this word bitch. And I just, you know, when the New York Times asked me if I had anything to say about Hillary Clinton and the word bitch, I was like, I guess so. I mean, I guess it's, it's interesting that um, two very different groups of people are in some ways uh, using this word in very different ways. And, um, you know, she's able to, like, honestly, I don't think she even cares about, either, you know, I don't think either way she cares. But it's fascinating that, you know, it's really taken on this kind of life uh, in reaction to her. And maybe, I mean, similarly, we were talking about this, uh, um, and I mean, your whole book is really addressing this question of how, um, you know, how the term feminism has changed in those intervening 20 years and the reception of it in, in terms of the mainstream um, usage of the, of the term. And you talk about how feminism has become cool in terms of mainstream feminism. Um, maybe you can, um, can you talk a little bit about why you think that is, and if you think it's actually true, um, is one thing I wondered as I was reading, and I'd love to hear from both of you on that. Do I think it's true that feminism yeah. has become cool? Yeah. I mean, I think feminism has always been cool. Um, <laughs> but so it I. is, you know, it is a word and it is a concept that has had, you know, just decades of, of just bad PR, um, bad optics. And yeah, I mean, I think there is a way in which, uh, you know, when, when we started Bitch 20 years ago, we did have this sort of nutty idea, like, w what would it look like if people actually really wanted to be identified uh, as feminists? Like, what would that look like? And it's not that that never happened before. I mean, I think there, there have been times throughout history where people have really embraced the word and have, have kind of embraced the label. Um, I think what's different it just in the past, you know, four to five years um, is really that people are embracing the label, but they're also seeing um, feminism in action, in everyday life, in practice, um, in very sort of everyday quotidian ways, no big deal ways, you know, on Twitter, in popular culture, amongst their friends. Um, that makes it seem much more accessible than it's ever been. Um, and I, you know, I think for a lot of people, the, I, the identity of an activist has always been sort of a bridge too far. You know, they might believe in concepts uh, like feminism, but they think of activism as you know, being out in the streets uh, or being at a sit-in. So I think part of what feminism has become is much more of a kind of everyday um, accessible identity. Do you want to comment on that, Roxanne? <laughs> um, no, I don't. I don't think that feminism is cooler today than it was 20 years ago, except for, um, I, you know, I think more people are claiming feminism, finally. 
um, especially because Beyonce, our queen, <laughs> did the work of standing in front of the word feminist. And, you know, that's what it takes. <laughs> that's it. We're good. Uh, We're done. But, you know, when you go beyond like media circles, uh, feminism is not as cool as, you know, it is in this room. This is not a sampling <laughs> of what women are doing. I live in Indiana, and I live in rural Indiana, and so I can tell you, no, feminism isn't cooler today, unless you live on the coasts um, or in a major city. But in middle America, feminism is still very much the F word. And that's the challenge, and that has always been the challenge, sort of how do we go beyond urban people to really get on board with feminism, even though you will find women who are very much feminists in the Midwest. They just don't want to claim it or, or you know, talk about it in any way. And that's the frustration and the challenge that we continue to face. I think that's what I'm getting at, because I, I don't think it's just in the Midwest, although I do totally believe in the, you know, the, the problem of the coast that you're highlighting. But I think that um, there's a way in which the sort of mainstreaming of feminism has forced a kind of, uh, or I don't know if it's forced, but there is also this other kind of, um, you know, whispered more um, kind of uh, behind the scenes feminism that involves more structural change that um, is very different than, you know, the Beyonce with the, with the feminist and neon. Um, you know, I, I think that, I mean, one thing that's occurred to me since we've, and we've just kind of gone public with this bureau, uh, a kind of soft launch of this Bureau of Feminism, but I've gotten a number of emails from colleagues and phone calls, and Ann Philbin has as well, from colleagues saying, it's so great you're doing that, this wish we could do it at our institution is the implication, like we're kind of, it's really great, but not sure we can do that, or, you know, it, it's a kind of um, um, reluctance still to be, uh, to be more public about um, the naming of it and the claiming of it. Yeah, in many ways, feminism is like porn. Keep it to yourself. Like, let's not talk about it and let's not be proud of it. I but never thought of it like porn, but it's true. Yeah, it depends on how you do it's feminism. Maybe a little bit Although true. that would imply that everyone does it, and I don't think we can argue that everyone does it. So <laughs> that would be cool, though. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> um, and do you think? Um, I mean, I'm curious to know that in each of your I mean, you're both sort of broadly speaking in the realm of popular culture, but in each of your um, different parts of the field, if you think there you know, are concrete examples in technology and journalism, for example, that where you see sort of structural changes really um, happening and see, see evidence of that. I mean, I think, you know, television, just representation, um, and then some, some of the ways that television is made now, the economics of it, um, particularly with you know, non-network shows, shows that are streaming on Netflix or Hulu or whatever. I think television is one place where uh, you know, creators who are bringing feminist perspectives to, te you know, to, to, to writing, um, to casting, et cetera, I think that, that is one place certainly where we're able to see you know, pretty significant changes or, or at least pretty um, obvious changes just in terms of what we're seeing, what's being talked about, um, the idea that you know, even if it's not feminism in name, it's feminism in, in representation and in subject matter and in a kind of nuance around discussing those things. Um, that, that, I mean, that, you know, not working in the industry, I could not say for sure, but it does seem like that's something that people are sort of taking up the mantle for. I think I, I know that that's true, and I also heard today on the radio some kind of, um, you know, on NPR, of course, on some uh, a report that I think the Directors Guild came out with today saying that still, um, you know, the percentages of of mainstream Hollywood films directed by women, if that's whatever indicator that is, and it is one, um, are still abysmal. You know, it's 67% um, um, directed by male filmmakers, and, and that doesn't even sound right, because that sounds too good. It's way lower, right? Yeah. That's way too generous. Yeah, yeah, it's, no, exactly. It's not that good. It's not, no, it's definitely not that good. Um, 
but maybe, um, you know, Roxanne, you're about to embark on a film project, um, and you could talk about that a little, but also this interesting, um, you know, challenge that you have of working with Marvel Comics and kind of inventing a, a really interesting new narrative for that um, context. You know, I don't think it's getting better. I think that, I mean, it's getting better in that we have like one or two things, and everyone's like, oh, it's a new day. And we should all be very happy with these scraps. I mean, it's, that's how low the bar is, that we get like half of a thing and we're like, oh, it's, everything is different now. My daughter won't suffer the way I did. Um, yeah, she will. Um, so that's really frustrating. Just today in the New York Times, there was an article saying, where will white men see themselves on television? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't even like say that with a straight face. Um, and this was like a dead serious article. I had to read it twice to make sure it wasn't satirical. And so as long as we still have that sort of nonsense, simply because last year there were like three diverse shows on television and this season, thank God for Oprah Winfrey and Ava DuVernay with Queen Sugar and Donald Glover with Atlanta and Issa Rae with Insecure. <laughs> and so, you know, but we can still name them. Meanwhile, there are 500 shows about an overweight white man and his very thin and gorgeous wife, Kevin James. Uh, so, you know, no, like we have to raise the bar and we cannot be satisfied with like getting our foot in the door. We need to break down the door. And so working with Marvel Comics is interesting because it's a bunch of dudes. And I, I'm fine with that. I have all brothers, so I'm good with them. And they're really nice because they're super passionate about comics and it's always a thrill to work with people who love what they do. And these guys love what they do. Uh, when I signed the contract, I didn't know I was the first black woman to write for Marvel. <laughs> I, um, when the New York Times story came out, I was like, <laughs> come on, that's a joke, right? Like, it's 2016. And so I actually emailed my editor, and I was like, this isn't real, is it? And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, it is. We didn't know either. <laughs> and like, why I, would they admit it? I know, like, why would you tell me that? It. But it's been really interesting. Because it's so male-oriented, they don't question anything I do. <laughs> It's so awesome. I just, I just turned in my first script and they're like, this is great. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because they're not used to it. And they're not used to sort of seeing women create. And it's interesting. It's interesting. But I know that this will mean that more women get to create mainstream comics. Because women are already working in comics, but perhaps not as visibly. Uh, and so I do hope that, again, with each advance that we make, the door gets knocked down a little bit more. And in terms of the movie, well, woman director <laughs> and co-writer. And then we're both women are writing a script, and our executive at Fox Searchlight is a woman. So it's going to be OK. <laughs> um, on, the, on the art side, I was thinking that the you know, thinking about what signs have changed that there are, and of course there are many, but I, I spent an afternoon um, today actually and um, talking with colleagues about, um, you know, the problem of, of sort of the repetition of the, of the male monographic exhibition at so many of the, the mainstream institutions and that this um, sort of, the devotion of certain real estate over and over to you know, mostly monographic exhibitions of white men, um, and what should be perhaps the feminist response to that. Um, it, it's really interesting to me that, you know, so many of us do our work um, and, you know, think that we're pushing up against these things and we are making certain progress, but I also do think that at least in the art world, it's time to kind of be much more explicit and covert about um, those agendas and, uh, workshop I spent my day at, um, which was really exciting, actually, and, and um, encouraging as well in many ways. Um, talked about Marvel Comics. I, um, I thought it might be interesting, given how young I think this audience may be, just sort of 
seeing the lineup of you all outside. Um, if we could each, or at least the two of you, talk about a little bit about your sort of origin stories as far as how you, um, you know, Andy, in your case, how you invented this amazing project 20 years ago when you were quite young at the time. Um, and also, Roxanne, I don't mean it. <laughs> Sorry. You're old now. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> I was young at the time, too. Um, <laughs> And, and then, uh, you know, Roxanne, um, you're sort of, um, uh, you know, how you found your way to, um, to writing and um, the voice that you have invented for yourself and created. You want to start, Andy, maybe? Uh, yeah, so um, I, was, I was just a magazine obsessive from, like, a very young age. I just loved magazines. I hoarded them. I collected them. I spent my lunch period in high school just in the library, just like eating a sandwich and reading like ancient copies of Rolling Stone. And I always knew I wanted to um, go into magazines because those were my favorite things, writing and graphic design and illustration. Um, and so my, you know, it didn't, it wasn't in any sort of linear progression. Like I did some internships at uh, magazines in New York City where I grew up. And then when my uh, co-founder and I moved from, after college, moved to the San Francisco Bay Area and uh, hooked up with a third friend of ours from high school who was actually working as a design uh, fellow at Mother Jones Magazine in San Francisco, um, one of the things we started talking about was starting a magazine. And at that time, you really could do zines, which were you know very small, hand-produced, um, We'd probably call them artisanal and small batch now, but then they were just like, get a stack of paper, paste up some stuff on it, and um, you know, take it around on foot to any store that will take it on consignment. And so we did talk about like what kind of magazine we would do, and one of the things we talked about was um, the real lack of feminist publications and the real lack of sort of accessible. Um, I guess feminist theory, for lack of a better word, you know, at the time, and this was, you know, before the internet, before blogs, or I guess when the internet was really in its infancy, um, we were, I always say we were sort of frustrated readers because we ended up writing about the, about the stuff we wanted to read but couldn't find because there wasn't much in the way of feminist pop culture writing that was between, you know, stuff in the academy like bell hooks or stuff that was in Rolling Stone, where they would occasionally talk about feminism in the most, you know, sort of vague, apolitical terms when talking about female artists who were then put on the cover in their underpants. So we really felt that there was a dearth of that kind of critical writing. Um, and, you know, when you're 21 and you have that kind of youthful stamina and hubris, you're like, okay, well, we're just gonna do it. Um, and we did, and we'd never expected to, you know, make money off of it. Um, but you know, we we did feel sure. We did feel sure that there were other people out there like us who were looking to read that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, as it turned out, there were, and we found them, as you tend to do when you are sort of an obsessive about something that a small group of people are also obsessed with. And you know, that's how we found our contributors. That's how we found our first art director. That's how we found, um, you know, people who wanted to help us with things like distribution and direct mail. So it just kind of grew very organically from, you know, that kind of uh, shared, shared interest and shared um, obsession with seeing sort of what kind of critical thinking could, could be out there in the realm of feminism and pop culture. It's interesting you mentioned the you know feminist theory and history and thinking about the sort of pre-internet moment or just at that moment when the internet was um, changing all of our lives. But I mean, the, the I remember when I was organizing the WAC show, which was about at that same moment, beginning to think about that exhibition. I mean, so much of my desire, um, aside from actually a weird thing, a weirdly ambitious, like I'm gonna organize a feminist blockbuster exhibition by the time I'm 40, like <laughs> thinking that would be a good thing to do, which it was, but everyone thought it would be a career, you know, tank for me. But um, 
But the relationship to history and erasure, which I think about a lot, because certainly younger generations of women don't necessarily know about that show or the origin of your project or other histories that are so important in terms of you know, creating a kind of genealogy of feminist thought and discourse. And the, my impetus for that exhibition was partly wanting to see those things, see those works of art that I'd seen, you know, one tiny reproduction of an Alice Neal painting in the history of art in Janssen, when in fact all of my artist colleagues and friends, we all were, you know, teaching and thinking about this work, but none of us had ever seen it in person. And of course, the internet has now changed a lot of that because of the circulation of all those images. But um, anyway, that maybe is something we can think about, the erasure of histories and, and what to sort of how to address that, what to do about that. But Roxanne, I'd love to hear about how you kind of um, came to writing and um, finding that voice, which is now taking so many different forms. It was a dark, stormy night. <laughs> and now, I've been writing since I was about four years old. I just always loved writing. <clears throat> and... I was very shy as a child and didn't make friends very well. And so I would sit at home and draw villages on napkins and then write stories about the people in those villages. And my parents were like, what's wrong with you? Um, you can use paper. <laughs> so they got me my first typewriter. And I started to just write stories and then the older I got and the more challenging life became, the more writing was a place where I could hide and feel safe and create people who would be my friends. I know how sad that sounds, but it worked. And uh, I just loved it. Writing is my happy place. It's sometimes I think self-medication. I write to make sense of the world. I write to tell stories and to amuse myself. I write to learn, and it just kept snowballing. I just never gave it up. It was a really good, bad habit to have. And um, so I went to college-ish, and <laughs> then I went back to college and had some corporate jobs and then went to grad school, and I just kept writing and writing. And uh, in 2000. Oh, God, I'm old. <laughs> in 2005, I went to get my PhD in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, which is about 10 hours north of Detroit and in the middle of nowhere. And I had nothing to do. And so I decided to start writing for serious and like to send to these fancy literary publications that I had tried and failed with for many years before that. And I also was creating a literary magazine with my great friend Matt Siegel called Pank. And we had a blog. And so I would write you know, posts about whatever I was thinking or feeling about the world on that blog for the magazine as a way to bring in readers and to sell the magazine and just as an outlet. And someone at a literary blog called HTML Giant was reading it. And they said, why don't you contribute for us? And so I said, OK, sure. And that was a bigger platform or blog, if you will. And so I would write there, again, just with crazy-ass opinions from the middle of nowhere. And uh, then the Rumpus read HTML Giant. And they were like, come write for us. And then Salon read me on the Rumpus. And then um, The Guardian read me on Salon. And the New York Times read me on The Guardian. And so it's all connected uh, back to living in the middle of nowhere. So if you're looking for how to do it, <laughs> just move. <laughs> to a place that's really remote with nothing to do and where all hope is lost. <laughs> and then you should be fine. I did that too, actually. It, it's a Des Moines, sure Iowa. Way. Oh, yeah. Des Moines is a cosmopolitan. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh my God, you're breaking my heart. This is, the, this is why I can't with city people. Like. <laughs> Des Moines is a big city. What the fuck? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I love you city people. That's, oh, that's cute. <laughs> I'm from Omaha, so Des Moines was, like, always the fancy city to go to. Now I know. <laughs> well, it, it taught me about the middle of the country, speaking of the middle of the country. Oh, so. I can bet. Um, were there, I'm curious, were there writers that were really important and formative to you? Uh, yes, Laura Ingalls Wilder. 
Yeah, really. Yes. Um, I love Laura Ingalls Wilder. I was a nerdy kid in the Midwest and reading about Laura Ingalls and Mary Ingalls and Pa and Ma and their lives made me think that my ordinary life could also be extraordinary and that I could tell stories about a girl from the Midwest and someone might find them interesting. And so she was and continues to be my influence. And then also Edith Wharton, um, because she's Edith Wharton and she's amazing. And she writes about class and women in a really incisive way. And uh, also Alice Walker. Um, we talked a little bit about, uh, with Andy, with your recent op-ed piece and Hillary Clinton, um, but I think we have to say a little bit more about the election, probably. Um, really? Or not. Really? <laughs> um, yes, we do. Yeah, I don't really have a question. I just... <laughs> How about that election? <laughs> yeah. I. That's pretty much it. I mean... I think it's going great. <laughs> I'm drinking some water on Hillary's behalf tonight. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I crap myself up all day. <laughs> like, this is just what I do all day, every day. Like, girl, what are you doing? Oh, don't worry, I'm just making she, up jokes. She needs some water. She needs some water. Um, I guess what, I mean, I would love to hear the both of you address is the, I mean, the, the bitch is um, one interesting, really important thing. Um, uh, but also, I think the um, what the the uh, the kind of feminists who have lined up behind Hillary Clinton versus um, the rest of us who have a more complicated relationship to that particular upper middle class white version of feminism that I think for many people she represents, um, and I'm wondering if you can maybe talk about that. Yeah, I mean, certainly. Yeah, this is this is. I mean, it's it all the funnies aside. I mean, this is, yeah, it's a, it's a big issue. I don't, I don't think um, it's as simple as if you want Hillary to be president, you support all her policies, you support the sort of corporate feminism that is um, the infrastructure around her and her politics. And yeah, I, I just don't think it's that, I don't think it's that simple. Um, it's really complicated to, to say, you know, it's very, I mean, it, I think it's really hard to say of anyone who is at that level of party politics, yeah, I think they're a really awesome person and I wholeheartedly support 100% of their policies. Like, that's just, not, that's never gonna happen. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think that there is this weird um, thing that is, you know, absolutely a, a sexist knee jerk response um, to women who support Hillary. Um, of saying, oh, well, you're just voting with your vagina. It's just because you want a female in the White House. Um, you can want a female in the White House and not want it to necessarily be Hillary Clinton and also recognize that it's probably, you know, the first female president is probably not going to be someone that feminists hand pick. You know what I mean? It's not going to be that person. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I mean it. It is. It's it's very complicated, and like most political discourse, it gets incredibly simplified, and uh, and misrepresented, and um, you know you do end up in these ridiculous conversations about it that you know I think we're all probably really tired of, um, but that doesn't <laughs> you know that doesn't mean she's not the best candidate at this point. That's a ringing endorsement. So <laughs> get behind it. Oh, I'm all for Hillary. I think she's a fantastic candidate. And, uh, I, you know, for me, I, I campaigned for her in 2008. And I, it, it's hard to see her accomplish everything she's accomplished and people still act like we're just doing okay. Like, oh, we'll settle for Hillary. Like, yeah, I'll settle for being a billionaire instead of a trillionaire. I mean, <laughs> she is not perfect. and. I have a lot of qualms, not even qualms, I have a lot of issues with, I think her vote on the Iraq war and the number of brown lives that were lost because of her decision, that really troubles me. And uh, some of her actions as Secretary of State really trouble me. But 
you don't get to this level of politics without blood on your hands. And so there's literally no single candidate that is electable that is not going to have things that upset me in their background. And so I do support her wholeheartedly and it's a travesty that people are assuming it's a close race or that they have to compromise some part of themselves to vote for her. It, it, I get it, I do get it, because I understand why she's not everyone's cup of tea, but it's also a little heartbreaking that this is the bar that we set for women, that she has to be exceptional and perfect. That's a hell of a thing to ask of anybody. Meanwhile, there's Donald Trump. <clears throat> so she's an excellent candidate and a flawed candidate, but he's trash. He's not even just trash, he's something worse than trash because trash was once useful. Um, and so I just can't even believe that there are people who are still like, oh, I'm agonizing over this. <laughs> what are you agonizing over? Do you know what is going to happen to brown people and black people and queer people and Muslims and anyone without an American passport? If this man is elected, I mean, do you really get what's at stake or are you living in a fantasy? And so this whole election cycle has been shocking to me and this past week in particular has been, oh, I, I wasn't gonna write about Hillary Clinton because <clears throat> there are these psychos that call my day job and whenever they disagree with me and they just make my life very unpleasant. And I was like, oh, I can't bring that into my world. <laughs> but I'm gonna bring it into my world because I think someone needs to stand up and say, I, I like Hillary Clinton and I'm not compromising anything by choosing to vote for her. Um, I, I like Hillary Clinton there, I said it. I actually feel like I want to open it up to all of you because I think there's a lot of great energy in the room and um, we're going to follow all this by a book signing and invite you all to continue afterwards. But um, I have, you know, I can carry on. I have more questions, but I'd love to bring you into the conversation. Oh, I love that it's men who are going to run around with the microphones. <laughs> That's what we do here at the Hammer. <laughs> Very attractive. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Just serious. keeping it real. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're very dapper. Sorry. <laughs> Who has a question for us? Hello in the green shirt. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Um, so adding on to the election conversation, I, I think that um, what goes into feminism and pop culture really came up with Bernie versus Hillary. Um, and I noticed I'm a junior in high school and all of my friends were very, very much pro-Bernie. And that sort of played into when Hillary was the candidate. They was It was like, absolutely not. Because I already devoted myself to Bernie for one reason, you know. Um, and I don't know. I just think that really, that kind of brought up for me the the issue of pop culture and feminism and how it is the norm at my school at least everybody is if you're if you don't consider yourself a feminist it's like it's very bad i mean it is really a I, which is a great Let's thing just bottle your school up <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah do you get like bullied do you get like your head stuck in the toilet i mean honestly probably <laughs> wow. no one would say that they're not though but the thing of, the thing is it's very it's it's a very certain type of feminism because it's pressured and you're not really aware of, um, I think, the background of it and of, of institutionalized sexism versus, like, I, j I just think most of the issues being talked about are kind of um, free the nipple and that kind of thing. And I, I just think the election really brought something, that, that kind of thing up, which is that we do need more women in, in power and that, um, like, to not, I don't know, just the, the amount of perfection, like you said, that was needed for Hillary, kind of, I, I was just curious what you guys thought on the, um, on the Bernie aspect of it and why that was so, so, uh, like, th why that my generation is so obsessed with 
with that kind of versus Hillary. I don't know. I, I just never really got it. Okay. It's so uh, awesome yeah. you're here, I have yeah. to say, as a junior in high school. Um, I'm going to go with sexism as an answer to that. I mean, and I'm, I'm saying this as like a middle-aged Jewish person who would, lo who would have loved to see, you know, Bernie, you know, who, who's very fond of Bernie and, and really thinks that there's been some good movement in terms of like Bernie bringing up these issues and getting people to talk about them and taking, you know, some of the horrible sting out of the word socialism. Um, but yeah, I do think there was a ton of sexism in the discourse of Bernie versus Hillary. We saw this in like, there was this one pop culture meme that was driving me crazy, where it was like side by side, Hillary and Bernie asking them ridiculous questions, like where do you stand on sriracha? And it was, it was totally, you know, it was totally uh, geared to make Bernie look incredibly cool and down with the kids, and Hillary looked like this completely out of touch old fart. Um, so that was one of those things, like there was this pop culture, uh, you know, sort of push to be like, oh my God, this old Jewish guy is just pop culture gold. He's so hip. He's like a Beastie Boys video. Um, and, you know, I do feel like a lot of that is down to sexism. It's sort of like, you know, nobody, Hillary has always been referred to by pundits and stuff as this kind of like nagging mom figure. And I think Bernie's ascendance really kind of made it possible for everyone to, to really jump on board with that. I would agree. You know, I think that sexism is what allows a man like Bernie Sanders, who technically, like if you look in the dictionary, would not be cool. Um, <laughs> that he can be allowed to contain multitudes and to be seen as hip and to appeal to young people while Hillary is the school marm and the, the, you know, the evil old lady that can't get in touch with the young folk. Uh, because we can only see women in very narrow ways. Meanwhile, men can do anything, and then they can fly. Uh, it's I incredibly frustrating. Uh, and it was just like that he got as far as he did is entirely because of sexism, even though he's also an excellent candidate. And he had a lot of important things to say about socialism and really how do we change the economic structure in this country. And how do we get money and corruption out of the political process? And I, I sincerely hope that doesn't get lost as we continue to move forward. And I, I think it will because we have very short memories. Um, but when you look at the Republican side, they had 18 candidates. And 17 of them were men. And 16 of them were crazy. <laughs> and just completely unsuitable. And the most unsuitable of them is the one that rose to the top. Again, because of sexism. It's just a lot to wrap your mind around. And this is why feminism is so necessary and why we have to go beyond sort of the surface feminism of just saying, oh, I'm a feminist. Well, I'm glad, but now we have to think about how do we put feminism into practice in our day-to-day -day lives, starting in elementary schools and preschools and high schools and just working it, you know, trickle up something a little there too. Oh, shit. Um, I I guess guess another question. A gentleman's choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have one, one before this person asked their question, just for you, uh, the young woman who just asked that question, or for anyone else who's your same age to ask, answer. Um, I, one of the things I wanted us to maybe address too is how young men of your generation see feminism. If you find that they're also, you know, embracing the term and understand what it even means, and um, I'd be curious about that. But we can go ahead here first. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to say, first of all, you three are some of my heroes, and I just want to say thank you very much for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's really important work. Thank you. Uh, I'm very curious what uh, all three of you would are just dying for people to do in terms of action. I mean, there's a lot of talk. There are a million opinions out there every, every day. But in terms of action that normal people can take who are on the side of feminism, 
male or female, what are you just really, really hoping people do in terms of concrete action? Vote. <laughs> you know, vote, and not only every four years in the presidential election, you have to vote in your local elections. So like the judge who gave Brock Turner three months in prison won't be a judge anymore. Feminism is genuinely affected by legislatures and judicial systems. And so it's a very small thing that anyone who's over the age of 18 can do. And so it's really important to vote. As trite as that might seem, it's actually not. We have such tragically low turnout for local elections and especially midterm elections that it, the most feminist thing you can do is show up. Um, yeah, I guess I, uh, what am I doing? Um, I came to the Hammer Museum three years ago, uh, and it was a, it was, there were many factors, um, but one of them very strongly was wanting to be in a place where there was a public discourse um, that paralleled an exhibition program and a visual arts program where, um, that was light on its feet and could move quickly and could address issues like we're talking about tonight. And that was a conscious choice to move away from a much larger, slower moving, much more, um, a bigger institution um, so that I could do more. Because I think that, um, I mean, just from the perspective of you know the art world, uh, as flawed and uh, as it is, I think that the time is now to act. Just, I mean, voting is one thing, but I think we have to also, with every single choice that we make in our exhibition programs and public programs and so on, be enacting, um, you know, a feminist discourse. And I think that a place like this is an easier place to do that. And I've found wonderful colleagues who feel the same way, and that's why we're all here. So we are, I mean, the Bureau of Feminism is one example of trying to. Um, um, you know, trying to start a certain kind of discourse, but um, there are others in terms of the collection here, how we build that, how we think about the women artists in the collection, for example. Um, so I think, I, I really believe very much in small incremental changes and how those add up over time, and I feel like I make those every single day at a place like The Hammer, um, it, you know, in terms of feminist choices. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my first choice certainly would have been vote. But I, I think also um, thinking thinking critically and then putting critical thinking into action. And I think this speaks a lot to the way popular culture and certainly media work um, and have always worked. But certainly today, just because of the just sheer enormity of media and popular culture and how much there is, um, it is really important to, to consider um, how those things how those things work, how the economics of them work, and how you as a person can, you know, make a difference. If your passion is in writing and, you know, you see that, you know, there are spaces for you and there are industries that need to be changed and that there are, um, that there's room for your perspective. I mean, I think we're all sort of um, urged in a lot of ways to just consume passively and to not think about ways that things can be different. Um, I think that's how we're urged to think about capitalism. I think that's how we're urged to uh, think about sexism and feminism, that these are just systems that we're in, we can't change them. So I think thinking critically and recognizing that, you know, maybe you can change them and trying to figure out what you, what you might be able to do and, and where the place for you is where you can make some change. <laughs> Hi, my question really has to do with, uh, you spoke about elementary school kids and, and younger children, and how do you think we get to a point of equality um, for girls in their learning environments where we see so many of these stories of uh, school dress code violations where girls are sent home over something silly like a spaghetti strap or the uh, girls in South Africa who were being told they had to have straight hair in order to be in school. Like, Where do our... 
where do we have a, a place, even as voters, because I do vote in all of my elections, um, to bring those issues up beyond just bombarding our senators with calls or, or things that uh, seem sort of banal in, in our activity? You know, I think parents have to join the PTA and you have to be active and on top of what's happening in your child's school. And the problem with that is that that is a luxury that not everybody gets to av avail themselves of because most people are at work during the day and then sometimes have second and third jobs and don't have time to sit around controlling the PTA and worrying about what's going on there. You know, in, uh, we also have to infiltrate. We have to get better administrators and better educators into our school and then hope that the people who enforce restrictive dress codes and who tell young black girls that their hair is inappropriate die. Uh, <coughs> of old age, of old age. Uh, because I think some people just can't learn. I, I hope that everyone can learn and can change, but some people can't change, and those are the kinds of people that we have to have pushed out of the school systems, and that does actually happen through voting. But it's being present, and it's pushing back, and making sure that we're doing the work of pushing back for our children, because I have a four-year-old niece, and she's four, and she should be allowed to be four. The rest of us can fight for her. Um, these young kids, and yet these kids are completely able to fight for themselves. It's breathtaking and awesome, which gives me a lot of hope, actually, for the work that feminism is doing and for the work that just all social justice movements are doing because we are raising a generation of young women and men that in many places are doing some really great activism just by living. And we have to continue to encourage those efforts instead of trying to stifle it or tell them, you know, no, be quiet, be small. No, be big and be bold. And, you know, it's just, but it's, there are huge problems and there is no easy fix for any of them. I would also add that I think it's, it's very much not just about the girls, although I, um, I, I mean, I, I'm a mother of two sons, and I think a lot about what it means to bring up young boys in this culture. And I think it's about making making them um, as comfortable and familiar with a discussion like this as a young girl is, you know, and making them understand what it what it means and not holding back on certain terms because they're not going to understand it. And I mean, they're learning empathy and they're learning social justice and they're learning all these really important things. but, um, they also have to learn about feminism, I think. Yeah, let's, the guy with the baseball hat, maybe, in the middle. I guess I'm supposed to be picking out the question, so. Do a better job. Um, I, first of all, I just wanna say thank you for an amazing panel. It was just, gave me life, you know, to be sitting here. Um, Professor Gay, thank you for responding to my tweet. I'm the one that drove from the 134. You drove on all the different freeways. Yeah. The 143 to the... The 134, the 101 to the 405 to be here. <laughs> thank Which, you, my friend. Um, my question, um, my day job is I'm a sociologist, and the hope is that no we... No big deal. The, 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 <laughs> We, you know, my when I was going into this gig, I was like, oh, we gather empirical evidence to help ch change people's minds about the world. And so nowadays we know that doesn't always happen. And I'm wondering, as um, for people that write about homophobia, racism, sexism, inter intersectionality, um, wh where do you find the strength to write for a society or an audience that has become increasingly fact resistant? And what in your <laughs> in your experience, what have you found as uh, the most impactful style of writing for um, changing the hearts and minds of people that are fact resistant? That's a good question. That's such a good question. Um, you know, I I don't want to I don't want to put all the presents under the Christmas tree of humor, but I do think that humor is a huge. Uh, way to change hearts and minds. I mean, not just humor, but fact-driven humor. I mean, that's why we respond so well to things like The Daily Show and Last last Week Tonight, because laying out, laying out facts, laying out statistics, um, and putting a humorous spin on them, and making them relatable, and making them visible through pointing out the absurdism of 
opposite points of view or you know the the reigning conventional wisdom has been really helpful and that's certainly something we always wanted to do with with bitch was you know get people to that place where they were amenable to the facts and sort of softening them up with humor um, I don't think that's but that's definitely not the that's definitely not the only thing I mean you really do need really persuasive arguments um, I think you know fact resistant is such a good way to put it because that really is what it is I mean there are so many people who you can who can have all the evidence in front of them and will just absolutely deflect um, you know in any way that's possible so I think it's it, we're in a, a, a really paradoxical time in the, in the sense that there's more ways to reach people than ever before, but at the same time, the fact resistance um, is much stronger and in a larger number of people than ever before. So we're, it's, it's, it's a conundrum. It's, that's a great question. And so I do try to use humor in some of my work. Um, I'm a Libra, and so, <clears throat> yeah. I'm always seeking balance, and so I'm always able to empathize with other points of view. And so in most of my opinion writing, I try to at least acknowledge the other point of view and to give it respect. Because so much of opinion writing is, this is how I feel, and you're absolutely wrong, and not only are you wrong, but you don't deserve to live. <laughs> and that doesn't help because when you hear that you feel attacked and you're going to of course be fact resistant you're going to be resistant to everything and so I do try to acknowledge other points of view I always think of you know where I live and I think of my family um, who are wonderful but conservative Catholics and I love them and I'm not it kind of change my relationship with them and they're also Haitians and Haitian culture is awesome, but <laughs> we, they have some ideas about certain things, and I'm here to change that <laughs> one day at a time. And, and so I always think about how do I reach someone like my dad? How do I reach someone like his best friend that he grew up with? And you have to do it from a place of empathy and a place of respect. There are people who cannot be reached. Um, David Duke and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Trump voters. Uh, most of them, you know, and there's, and that's hard. And that's a, a wall that I, I, I continue to run up against over and over. I just keep throwing myself against that wall thinking if I just write something pretty enough, I will change their minds and the world will be okay. Uh, but you also have to know when to walk away. When someone can't be reached by empirical evidence, you can put all the studies in front of them and they're going to say, that's not what Glenn Beck told me. Uh, because personality is more important than fact. And so don't try to reach those people. I always just try to reach people that can be reached, people that are willing to listen, and people that I am willing to listen to. Yes. A, a woman in, oh. We'll get you next. Yes. <laughs> we'll get as many of you guys as we can. Don't worry. Okay. okay, I'll go next. <laughs> he just straight up gave her the mic and snatched it back. <laughs> wow, that was awful. It'll go to you. <laughs> um, this is a question about feminist particu feminism, particularly in communities of color and how that's evolving. And this question comes from back in the late 80s when I was in college, so I'm really old, except not. Um, I was part of a group of women, multicultural group of women that founded a women's center at our college, and we taught a class on race and gender, and although our school was about 92% white, 8% black, 50% of the women in the course were black, 50% of the women in the course were white. But fast forward 25 years, and none of the black women from that class that I'm still in relationship with identify as feminists. And I would say among my girlfriends, I have a very multicultural group of friends, those who are most strongly feminist identified are primarily Caucasian, Asian, or Middle Eastern. My black and Latino girlfriends, not very much. And some of that I think has to do with just the primacy of race in America in the lives of blacks and Latinos. But I'm curious, and particularly for you, from you, Roxanne, how you see that evolving. Um, I see two places that are encouraging. One is the 
um, intersectionality between race and LGBT community in the Black Lives Matter movement, and then also the recent response to the Nate Parker scandal where black women and men stood on the side of the victim or the alleged victim um, and were able to see past the typical narratives around race and gender. And I'm just wondering what you're seeing and what you're, how you're seeing that evolving in 2016. Yeah, that's a great question. <sighs> It's a great question. <laughs> you know, feminism has long had a race problem, a race problem and a queer problem, because mainstream feminism has typically concerned itself with middle class, heterosexual white women. And it has told black women and queer women that we will, and working class women, for that matter, we'll get to your issues once we secure something for ourselves. That's actually not how it works. Um, but that's how feminism has worked. And so a lot of women of color and black and Latina women in particular are very resistant to feminism. And feminism in the mainstream doesn't seem overly concerned with bridging that gap. You know, why is this problem? Because feminists aren't doing enough. And it might seem like they're doing enough in our small media communities because everyone says the right things and does the right things. But I don't see a lot of outreach going beyond the media bubble. And sometimes you need to be invited to the table. You're not gonna show up because you've been uninvited and disinvited for so long that you'll give up. You're like, fuck this, I'm not gonna put myself out there again. And so we need to see more outreach in feminist circles. We, I think people need to sit in the rooms that they're in and look around and say, oh, man, where are the people of color? And where do we find them? I travel all across this country and most of my audiences are, because they're my audiences, kind of diverse, and the organizers say, oh, this is amazing. We've never had black women show up before. And I'm like, and you haven't questioned that until now? <laughs> you, you know, and then they're like, we just don't know what to do. As if people of color are these very curious alien beings and that they don't know where we live. You know where we live. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, we have to go to those neighborhoods. And so like, if I were here, I would put up signs in Baldwin Park and Compton and say, you know, we are interested in you in Echo Park. Um, so you have to do that kind of outreach and that kind of outreach literally off has to be boots on the ground. And until that's done and more women of color feel actively welcomed into feminist conversation, it's not really gonna change. I don't blame black women and Latina women for being like, ah, eh, I'm not really into all that. But the reason I say I'm a feminist and not a womanist is because I, I just came up educationally through feminism, having attended predominantly white institutions. And I decided, when I decided to commit to feminism, that I recognized that there wasn't a place for me, but I was gonna make one. And sometimes you have to do that too. And it sucks to always be the first and to have to do all that hard work and then have to continue to justify your existence on a daily basis. And I guess I do it so that no one else has to. I, I would hope that I'm the last one who has to do this, even though I know I'm not the last one. Clapping for myself. Yay! The woman in the green top back there. Yeah. Hi, I'm, um, I don't have a question as much as I have a request. I am very fascinated, uh, Roxanne, by the idea of a martial arts in a comic book. Because what I'm really afraid of is we've always been delineated as real sexy and we do the exact same things the guys do. And to me, that's not what women do. And I don't want to just see ugly costumed women fighting like men. And because I'm a martial artist and the martial arts that I happen to um, work in is Aikido, but it's... I work in this real fringe end where we, I annihilate my enemy before we even start because I don't recognize him as an enemy. Mm -hmm. And so because of my power of love, I am no longer defensive and I am no longer offensive. So what I'm actually doing is I'm merging with his expression to punch, kick or whatever he chooses to do 
and I can, because I'm not standing my ground, I can move myself in a way that I'm protected and I am protecting him as well. Not only physically, but karmically. So I would be, I really want you to make me a superhero. <laughs> Besides the fact that I've become so unfuckable, I now possess invisibility. Okay. So, I will absolutely see what I can do for you. Thank you. You're welcome. I think you are a superhero. Oh, thank you. Uh, That uh, couldn't have been timed better because I have a question about comics too. Okay. <laughs> um, so you mentioned earlier that you're working with Marvel and you're the first female writer for Marvel. Black female. Black female writer for Marvel. And they're not necessarily questioning your the choices you're making or I don't know the, all of the intricacies of, of the story. But do you find that that is an advantage and you want to run with it to do whatever you want? as some other people have used the platform to take advantage of it? Or does it, at any, on any level, does it frustrate you and you want that extra criticism? Oh no, I get criticism. They just don't question the choices that I make for the women and their stories. But they give me all kinds of feedback. It's just the most editing I've ever gotten. <laughs> and I think that's, again, because Marvel is a huge corporation and they know what works and what sells. And this is my first time writing a comic. And so I am getting a lot of guidance. Like I proposed um, for the second issue a storyline. They were like, oh, well, the Ultimates are somewhere in, else in the universe at this time. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I have to go and I have to read all the issues that they're talking about and catch up. Because when you write for Marvel, you have to work within Marvel continuity. And so that is actually the biggest challenge, uh, is trying to figure that out. No, the freedom that they've given me is the freedom to basically tell the story I want and to represent black women as I see fit. And I find that freedom necessary and exhilarating because that's not something they can critique. I think we should actually just take like one more question and then um, move our discussion out to the kind of book signing arena. <laughs> All right, we'll take yeah. two more. We'll take her and then somebody from the middle here. We'll take the rest of your questions in the courtyard. Hi, so I'm a really big Harry Potter fan. And so when I saw, when I saw that Emma Watson started this he for she campaign and this like book club and she's a UN ambassador, I was really excited. But then part of me is like, do we need another young, straight, thin, white woman being the face of this movement? And I think my larger question is that sometimes people who identify as feminist, identify as progressive, are well-meaning, are often the most easily offended. And given we have an audience here, we probably all identify as feminists. So what is some advice you might have for us that is uncomfortable or that you think some of us might need to hear about making space for a more inclusive feminism. Damn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is something that, that we deal a lot with um, sort of on the day-to-day -day at Bitch in terms of covering current events, assigning articles. Um, you know, the question of are we, as a, you know, majority white, uh, majority, actually, no, we are mostly majority white. We, uh, yeah, anyway, um, is this, are we the best organization to cover this particular story? Um, and it might be a current event story, it might be a longer analytical piece that has to do with race or disability or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, we, we are often in the position to be like, you know what, this is, a, this is a, a place for us where we're better suited to maybe amplify the voices of others. So that might be uh, assigning a story to someone who really wants to write about it, um, but has, you know, doesn't feel necessarily 
uh, interested in writing it for a majority white media organization. So we try to figure out where they're at and amplify the outlet that they're writing for. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's definitely a ton of ways to sort of get out of the way to amplify others' voices, to seed the microphone. Um, and a lot of times it just has to do with saying no. I mean, I, th I think the, the reality, and I think both Roxanne and I have written about this, is that when you're talking about the public face of something, especially something that has traditionally been as hard to sell as feminism and gender equality, um, people want to make it palatable to the, the largest amount of people in the shortest amount of time. And so a very easy way to do that is to pick someone who already has some sort of, you know, brand recognition, for better or worse, uh, who is attractive, who is young, um, and, you know, in the case of feminism, who is, you know, who is recognizably uh, feminine, female, and um, to some extent, you know, not necessarily threatening. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's really a challenge, and it's something that uh, white feminists in particular need to examine very carefully uh, because, you know, I've certainly been guilty of this in the past. You know, you're like, well, I have thoughts on this. I want to rush right in uh, without necessarily thinking, like, well, who, whose voice might I be overshadowing? Whose voice might I be taking the place of? Uh, I think that was a great question. And when I first heard about he for she, I was like, oh, give me a break. Are you serious, Hermione? Uh, <laughs> because I understood exactly why she was chosen. And then I went to the TED Women Conference in 2015, and I met the woman who's the actual director of He For She, and it's a black woman. And she's amazing. And she, we talked, because uh, I was like, can I ask you something? I, I don't know what, I, I think I had, I was hung over, because I was just like, why did you pick this young girl? <laughs> like, why aren't, because you are flawless. Why are you not out there as the face of he for she? And she explained that he for she is, it's more than just this slogan and this campaign. And so I think a lot of the, what we need to do to be better as humans and as feminists is to go beyond our first impressions and our first reactions and our surface understanding. And oftentimes when we have these celebrity gatekeepers, people think, oh, this famous person's a feminist and I love them and so I'm gonna say I'm a feminist and that's that. But your work as a feminist can't start, I mean, it can start there, but it can't end there. You have to then go further. And I think one of the key things that people can do that will make them uncomfortable is to stop asking for permission. Not a week goes by when someone doesn't say, what can I do? I mean, shit, stop asking what you can do and do something. It may not be successful, and it may not be the perfect thing to do, but you are absolutely wasting time asking for permission. And the reason you're asking for permission is because you, you want to be recognized for doing the right thing. You want to be sort of given some cookies for it, and that's not how feminism works. And so I think, you know, just start doing instead of waiting for permission or waiting for direction, because... I already have a job. <laughs> I think uh, we'll, we'll take one more, maybe right in the middle, and then we'll adjourn to the courtyard. <laughs> nice work. I saw you raising the hell out of your hand. Good for you. So. My question has to do with the heart. You know, um, how do, what are some strategies or mantras or ways that you hold your heart as you're doing the work that you do? Because you, um, not just in writing and having, um, Roxanne, you mentioned the people that hate you and then start emailing your day job, but there's also the thing of working in community and being really disappointed with the people that you might be working very closely with and being very disappointed sometimes in yourself. So how do we, how do we also turn toward our heart and, and you know, what, what are, I don't know, some strategies on, on heart. I try to remember every day that I can only do so much and that I can only 
do my best. And on the days when I don't do my best, I tell myself, well, tomorrow I will do better than I did today. And there are certainly times when I say I've done enough. And that has been the hardest thing for me, honestly. And it's something I'm still very much working on is recognizing when I've done enough, when it's time to say, Roxanne, take a step away. The revolution is gonna continue with or without you. And you have to take care of yourself and your heart. And of course, I think it also means surrounding yourself with people who will hold on to your heart when you can't. And so I have a really amazing network of friends and loved ones who hold me up and who make my work possible. If it wasn't for my best friend, I wouldn't be able to do this, honestly. So it's also having someone who takes good care of my heart for me. Yeah, for me, it's realizing when I need to step away and, and realizing when I need to sort of ground myself in um, the physical world and not you know, concentrate all my energy in the million faceless people whose voices are in my heads when I'm writing anything. Um, yeah, I mean, it's that and, uh, and Xanax, obviously. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, really sort of realizing like, yeah, again, like this is, this is ongoing work. You know, this is not something that is going to be solved today or tomorrow or even in the next five years. Um, and, you know, burnout uh, is a really, it's, it's, a, it's a very strong issue for anyone who writes um, from the heart and writes in any sort of activist capacity and recognizing that, um, you know, you're, you're no good to anyone and you're no good to yourself um, if, you, if you don't keep perspective and keep in mind that, that you can only do so much at one time. It's a great question to end on, I think. I, I agree with everything um, Roxanne and Andy have both said. I also would add to that um, gratitude, which is a kind of uh, oddly lame word at the moment or something. Um, but, but I think a, a sort of healthy respect and gratitude for the privilege that all three of us actually have had and have on a daily basis in various ways. That, that um, having um, a certain amount of power that one occupies and being able to think about how to occupy that and how to marshal that is an incredible privilege. And I feel really aware of that. And, and um, you know, on days or weeks or moments when one gets really discouraged about the work and how it doesn't, nothing seems to change, yeah? It's just such an amazing privilege to have even these kinds of conversations, even if we're talking to a room of feminists um, and not necessarily converting anyone. Um, but uh, it's just um, a gratitude for the, for the platform, I guess, and the, the privilege that we have. So maybe we'll end on that um, and say thank you for fantastic questions. And I would invite you all to join us um, just outside in the courtyard. And we will have books available. and. Um, Andy and Roxanne have graciously agreed to sign them. Thank you both very much. Thank you.